Tonight is the uh, Tonight is the first night of the capital budget overview and we're going to be dealing with the capital budget um, and a presentation. First of all, before we begin, are there any declarations of interest? Seeing none, I uh, just want to confirm the agenda for this evening. Uh, Mr. Clerk, there are uh, the two reports that we're going to be dealing with um, and, there, and there's no closed session uh, unless required. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Kirkopoulos to take us through this just um, to let you know um, there's uh, we have our package that's that's here with us. Um, um, Mike and Angela have produced a, um, a PowerPoint presentation that they're going to be taking us through. There's 63 slides um, and when we've gone through that uh, with all the, the department heads um, we should be at a completion point. So just a reminder this evening, um, we can, uh, the, the preference is to ask questions about the budget items as they come up um, for clarification on things. Um, tonight is not for discussing the merit or lack thereof of the capital items. Um, we will be dealing with that on Saturday. So, um, and with that, Mike, I'm turning it over to you. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, that's better. Uh, the process that we're gonna go through this evening, uh, we will be taking you through a, an overview uh, that Angela and I will be doing, and then each of the department heads uh, will be providing you uh, a capital budget presentation um, as we go through the budget. Uh, I'll be giving the presentation for SRC, Director Hussein is not here this evening, uh, and that's the last one, uh, so I will be giving you that presentation. Uh, tonight's agenda uh, will really be that financial overview uh, that both Angela and I will give you, as I said, the departmental presentations and then a general Q&A at the end, uh, as well as any information uh, that you want us to prepare in anticipation for this Saturday. I can tell you, as I've heard from uh, a few councillors as it relates to the Saturday schedule, I know a few folks have to leave a little bit early. One member of council won't be there. So we can definitely have a conversation about Saturday in terms of expediting uh, how Saturday goes uh, in order to address some of those uh, potential uh, scheduling conflicts. <coughs> uh, so what's different this year? Uh, council meetings, one-on-one -on -one meetings to identify areas of concern. Uh, you'll recall that over the last number of months uh, that uh, senior staff met with all members of council. Uh, some of you, we did it uh, via phone and email, but for the most part, we tried to sit down with everyone, talk to you about both the capital and operating budgets, but specifically what you wanted to see in the capital budget, what were some of the projects that were of issue, uh, and what were some of the things that you wanted us to uh, be anticipatory with and ensure that we included in this particular budget. Uh, SMT also determined some of the priorities with the objective of aligning uh, the needs that we had with available funding, we looked at maximizing external funding to fund those capital project needs, and we took an exhaustive look at the 10-year capital plan to confirm both the needs and validate direction with council, and we presented that to you uh, early in August. So what's the budget process? Uh, you've likely seen this slide before in years past and in your budget, budget package, but it really starts at the top with planning, developing, presenting to council, and the community for conversation, for deliberation, for dialogue, approval, implementation, and then monitoring and reporting, of course. Today we're gonna to be dealing with the capital budget, uh, and you know most of you uh, are well aware of what the capital budget deals with, but it pays for new and rehabilitation of assets owned by the town. Uh, it looks at new construction, rehabilitation of roads, water mains, parks, buildings, as well as equipment purchases. So when we look at the 2017 capital budget and some of the highlights, what we're presenting is a budget uh, in excess of $11 million and it's funded through the following means. 38% is funded from asset replacement reserves and reserve funds. 19% is growth related with funding from our DC reserve fund. 18% is funded from external sources such as federal and provincial governments as well as other sources. We've identified 14% 
through debt funding and the remaining 11% being funded and supported through the tax levy. So when we look specifically at capital and the capital budget process, we're looking at life cycle, reserves, reserve funding, and debt services as highlighted on the previous slide. So the approach we're taking to the capital budget is really looking at a set of management tools used to assess the required infrastructure investments, in other words, prioritization, and those include things like life cycle costing, risk assessment, risk-based infrastructure management, asset management, planning, and continuous improvement. So you've likely seen this slide before when we presented the 10-year capital plan, uh, and this really highlights the 10-year the infrastructure gap that we have, uh, which is approximately $20 million over that 10-year time frame. You'll recall again when I came to you in August, we presented a, a comprehensive um, plan that looked at what is our infrastructure gap and how do we potentially fund that infrastructure gap. As well, Angela and her team are undergoing a comprehensive asset management plan update. So in terms of strategies to mitigate and manage that capital budget, again, these were some of the things we talked about at that time. We talked about reviewing the list of projects and how do we repurpose certain funds in order to finish works that are in progress and reevaluate those that have not yet started to determine if they're still required. We talked about a special capital levy dedicated towards the roads program, for instance, and we looked at possible scenarios of both 0.5% and 1%. We talked about the new infrastructure stimulus program through the provincial and federal governments and how do we leverage uh, those provincial and federal allocation opportunities. And then we talked, of course, about the needs versus wants and prioritizing infrastructure spending in areas where they can be catalysts for economic development or we can see more private sector investment coming where we can see you know, an investment we make in one area uh, be, be used to uh, generate more revenues in other areas. So some of the additional mitigation efforts, uh, you know, that we have also looked at, and I know these are things that uh, over the over the year councils identified. I know when this budget came out, these are a few of the things that you asked me, um, specifically as it relates to IT, for instance. Uh, we are looking at moving some of our older uh, but still good equipment to lower need areas to extend the asset life. We're seeking out special funding for needed public works projects. Again, there's some infrastructure stimulus programs that we've been uh, starting to be more successful with and we're seeking out additional funds. Um, from an SRC perspective, we're looking at developing design plans before construction so that we can have better planning and achieve some of the needs we want by looking at planning and bundling of certain projects. We're looking at extending the and examining our fleet life cycle. I know this is a question that comes up. I mean, I remember watching from the audience last year and a number of questions came up around extending our fleet life cycle and I know Dave's gonna speak to that in his portion of the presentation. Again, we're looking at prioritizing projects and what can be deferred versus what is required to move forward now. And we're also looking at where we can work with the region around streetscaping and some master planning work that they can do for us so that again, we can mitigate the impacts to our budget. <clears throat> Some of the key projects and budget themes that I, you're going to hear in this budget as we move forward today, Saturday, and then later in the month when we talk about operating is really around Prudhams and the Prudhams development. Uh, Dave's going to take you through the roads investments. Parks and facilities investments is something that we've identified uh, significantly in this budget, both on the operating and capital sides. You're going to hear about safety and security, and that's from an IT and fire perspective. And again, safe drinking water investment with some of our uh, works projects. So I'm going to turn it over to Ange to kind of take you through the next few slides. Thank you. So here you'll see uh, the draft capital expenditures. We've grouped them into the four categories. We have equipment and rolling stock grouped together, roadways, facilities, and parks and environmental services. As you can see, roadways is the largest component of the budget and environmental services second, and that one is funded through reserves. You've seen this chart before. This is the one that was presented during the 10-year capital plan. This is like identifying the capital fund gap, which is just over $17 million, and looking to look at what we need to do to address the needs here going forward.
one of the revenue sources that we do use is debt and projecting our debt based on this budget and future uh, budgets. We're looking at um, annual payments. These are debt payments in comparison to our 10% of levy um, debt indicators as well as the province's 25% principles that we don't follow, we follow the 10%, but these are the debt payments that we are currently making annually in the purple. Sorry. And quickly on this point, um, through you, Mr. Chair, you know, I think you've, you've heard me say, when, again, we were before you during the uh, previous overview on the 10-year capital. Uh, Council has been very good at adopting very strict principles as it relates to debt. Uh, you see here that as it relates to those debt payments, we're, we're well underneath our own guidelines, which are very conservative as a municipality. And, and, and this council and previous councils have both validated and ensured that those principles remain stringent. And, and again, as Angela pointed out, our provincial guidelines, which are significantly higher, we remain incredibly low. This uh, slide uh, shows the outstanding debt that we'll be carrying from year to year. So th this is the amount that we'll be having at the end of the year. So, for example, in 16, we'll be carrying 6.5 million and so on. Uh, it increases in 2019 with the additions of um, the museum and the Drake Avenue. This is the infrastructure replacement cost. This is actually from our TCA software. This shows the replacement cost of all our assets that we own currently. This is just to give council a feel of what, you know, is out there, what we own and what we need to start funding in the future. This isn't all due now. This is just right now. If we were to replace everything, these are the dollar values that we'd be replacing. And so you're looking with this chart through you, Mr. Chairman, at about $45 million in, in replacement costs of all of our infrastructure if we were to bring it all up to a certain point and replace it right now. So again, just, just an opportunity to give Council the, the, the vastness and I think the holdings that as a municipality we have um, and, and how we use this type of indicator uh, and some of the work that both Rosalie and, and Ange are doing in terms of looking at our assets to determine what needs to be upgraded and when. I believe, again, you've seen this chart as well. This is showing, again, the annual uh, capital expenditures year over year, and they do fluctuate depending on the projects that we take on. The capital levy, the dollars are set funded through the, for capital through the cap, through the levy itself. The dollar, the capital levy increase impact has been maintained pretty modest year over year. If you can see the percentage impact on the levy has been rather low and if you look between 2009 to 2017 we are just getting back above that 2009 so nine year span and we're just heading back over to where we were back then while at the same time maintaining the improvements that we've been doing which is pretty incredible. So I think just to pick up on where Angie's that add on that particular item and I know um, I know that, uh, you know, I've had this conversation uh, with a, a number of members of council. Um, you know, I think if you look at that second line around the capital levy, it does show that, that council has been very consistent in terms of not wanting to impact from a levy perspective the taxpayer, but finding other means by which to fund our, our projects. You'll see in 2013 with the Fleming Centre and other initiatives that we brought forward that that spiked in terms of our capital expenditures but again the impact on the levy has remained consistent. You'll also see in the far two right hand side columns uh, that we've given, given you proposed scenarios of both a 0.5 percent as well as a 1 percent increase dedicated specifically to roads. As it stands right now the percentage impact on tax levy in 2017 is 0.288 and then when you incorporate the the 0.5 and the 1.0, you're looking at 0.738 and 1.3 impact to the levy if we were to look at some of those scenarios. <coughs> so this, uh, this last slide in terms of our overview is really uh, something that I wanted to share with you, something that we adapted from the City of Edmonton uh, not too long ago and it really focuses on uh, elements that impact infrastructure management and some things that are beyond our control and some things that we need to be cognizant of and, and determine how we how we manage uh, and those you'll see include things around social and cultural issues that sometimes uh, change where investments are made new technologies which are important 
some of the inflationary impacts that inevitably happen, uh, economic growth, uh, demographic changes, resident expectations as always impact where we spend money and how we spend money, uh, environmental impacts, and of course the political, um, the political lens around the multiple levels of government and the type of infrastructure programs that are available. So, you know, when you look at this and you look at the opportunity to innovate, you look at the opportunity to do some things, it does require a strategic approach. There's a strategic element to where we invest on the infrastructure side. There is a need to bridge uh, both policy, which is really stuff that council sets with service delivery in terms of the, the work that we do as the administration, with ultimately our goal being long-term sustainability. Okay, so we're off into the departmental reviews. <coughs> Information technology. <clears throat> uh, this year, uh, IT has been working on a number, have, have been dealing with a number of challenges. One of the biggest ones, I would say, is maintaining, making sure that we have sustainable network and communications if there is an emergency. So they've been working on that, ensuring that that information continues to flow, delivering a fast, consistent service in a growing and challenging environment. The municipality is looking to be more efficient and effective, providing staff the needs and the equipment required to manage their department, as well as we have staff growth to manage as well. So IT has been working with those different various departments to ensure that they can provide all the levels of service that they require. Um, in, in addition, the, um, the IT is also looking to provide town, protect town assets, both physical and digital. The opportunities, we've been looking to create efficiencies for staff through um, technology, interdepartmental data linkages to improve information available to decision makers. So what we're looking there is to provide, to ensure that departments are sharing information so it's one decision being made as opposed to each department working in silos and making various decisions. We're looking to share information and make one decision. And thirdly, improve customer service through public portals and open data. We're trying to sh um, share information with the public as well as that provides efficiencies in the town as well by reducing staff need. The priority is that um, these different projects that we put into the capital budget align with is to customer service, to strive to be known as a by citizens for a positive and high quality service center culture to manage the town in a manner that protects the quality of assets, delivers services in an effective and efficient manner, and encourages working environment that creates opportunities for efficiencies in service delivery to ensure high value to Lincoln taxpayers. This is one of the areas where we always look to protect town assets. And thirdly um, is, I forgot, create and encourage active engaged dialogue with the community so communications to maximize the use of technology and build up a proliferation of social media and new media challenges. So we're always looking to IT to uh, build communications. So improving customer service, one of the projects that fall under this is information technology update. Because we are providing um, replacement equipment, updated equipment to our frontline staff, this is improving our customer service response times. Without that, if we failed, then we're, if the equipment fails, then we fail as in our customer service. And we're using, um, using a technology to improve workflow and information between departments to aid in decision making again and to reduce duplicate efforts. So again, that's one time, one effort to making decisions. Protection of town assets uh, is number two. That's our alarm system modernization. We're looking to protect town assets physical and reducing risk through increased security and improved accountability. So what we're saying here is we're looking to update our alarm system to protect town assets, make sure that people who are entering and exiting buildings should be, and that makes those people accountable as well because we can identify who has been um, accessing our facilities. Improving communication. EOC and COC phase two telephony implementation of a full feature phone system for applicable staff and decision makers if, I, I, if town hall is unavailable in an emergency system. So this is to ensure that we have a backup system should, our, should this location go down, that we have a backup phone system available for um, continued operations in an emergency situation. Redundant dispatch system phase four. This is the, the, this is the final phase of the project. 
improving an existing telephone infrastructure to allow communication in times of disaster for fire and operations staff. So this is if the cellular services go down, the external staff that we require, fire and operations staff, we could still communicate with them by having this redundant dispatch system in place. The efforts that were taken to mitigate and manage budget increases there was uh, many discussions with departments to find out what their technological and digital needs were, so that was the first step. Prioritizing the projects and deferring any lower pro need projects. Reviewing life cycle items and based on the likelihood of failure and risk and determining the possible extension of service life, again moving assets around to lower need areas. And then focusing on long-term planning to avoid purchase of um, items that are later will be redundant and no, no further requirement. So we're looking to see if there's a need for them down the road. Um, Mike, before we go any further, so um, as we're going through this, um, <laughs> should we take a pause at the end of, of each one of these chunks and, and if there's any questions on those particular items that have been brought forward, we do it at that particular point? Yeah, that would make sense, okay. Council. Okay, so so we've had um, the IT presentation and the four items um, that are on it, um, projects number one through four. So um, are there any questions um, to um, Angela or Mike on those particular items at this point? Um, the, one, uh, the one question I had was on, um, on the uh, the, uh, the sharing of information and so I, I see a lot of equipment and, and stuff like that. Um, what's the theory? Is there a software uh, package of some variety going to be put in place or, or what's the thinking process around the sharing process? The sharing of information, we're looking to implement, yes, there will be softwares available that we'll be using throughout the town hall to have a uniform system and work order system as well. But we'll also be ensuring that we have, um, sorry, I might need John Brown on this one. Um, we're also looking to ensure that we have the infrastructure in place to manage all that software as well. So that's what is in capital and then we'll have an operating component as well. So, Knowing both myself and Councillor Thompson's interest in this area um, for Saturday, um, um, it would be nice to have a discussion about um, where that's going as well. So, okay. Um, Councillor Bernay. Thank you, Chair Foster. Just one quick question. Um, uh, maybe it's not necessary, but I just noticed in the uh, alarm system, um, I, I believe we're still moving to to move the museum from Jordan to the old library. Um, is there any reason that while we're moving there that we need an alarm system there for that period of the one year? Or, um? Um, again, I, we don't want to get into the merits or, or thereof um, this evening, if, if that's okay with you. Um, but that will be a good question for um, for staff when, when we bring this up on, on Saturday, so. Perfect, thank okay. you. Okay, is that okay? Um, Councillor Thompson and then Councillor McMillan. Thank you, uh, Chair Foster. Um, through you to uh, whoever wants to take it, pretty much. <laughs> if it's um, technical, you can direct it to Mr. Brown. <laughs> it's, it's not that technical, actually. It's just sort of a, a question that, that um, I see there's a lot of replacement of workstations, et cetera, et cetera, um, a lot of hardware. And I'm just wondering if that has been incorporated with the library's uh, IT. Uh, is there some library stuff in there or is that separate? Because, no, the library has their own IT project sheet. Right, which is pretty much blank, so that's why I was wondering. No, their, their, their purchases are separate from ours. Thanks. Councillor McMillan. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. In, um, in references to um, um, technology upgrades, there are references to new workstations for um, the possibility of new staff coming in and that the, the potential hiring then would be referred back to 
our um, operating budget rather than this particular budget. So if that does not happen, these figures can change then? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's move into the next department, which would be fire, rescue, and emergency services. Seat here, no pun intended. <laughs> uh, yeah, so essentially, uh, just for my presentation on behalf of the uh, fire department, uh, just want to identify some challenges that we're facing. Um, these are, you know, really uh, higher level challenges. They affect uh, the uh, capital budget we're we're looking at, as well as they they do uh, morph into the the operating as well. So the, everything's intertwined. So one of the biggest challenges we have, obviously, is population growth. And uh, with that, uh, we have uh, quite a, a demand for support to planning and development, such as plans, reviews, site plans, and so on. <clears throat> that really does, uh, you know, affect, you know, some of the, the human resources, equipment, and facilities we're, uh, we're looking at. And that's going to be, be particularly um, important over the next few years as we have some uh, pretty big developments, prudums and whatnot coming online. Uh, we do have a fairly significant uh, role to play in some of this uh, development, and which kind of morphs into the next point here with the building inspections uh, from a building code perspective, you know, in inspecting some of the fire safety components. Uh, as the population grows, we actually have uh, additional fire safety inspection demands for fire code and compliance. And as the population grows as well, basically the character of the community changes, and with it, there's a shift in uh, the risk profile of the town. So we have significant work ahead of us in not only assessing what that risk profile is, but how do we manage it, how do we mitigate it? And it's not just sheer numbers, we're looking at demographics and you know things like of that nature. Uh, public education programming, emergency preparedness programming, and as I mentioned, uh, some of the human resources, equipment, and facilities with respect to the, you know, traditional response services as well. We also are finding uh, an increasing regulatory regime, um, which also leads into, you know, the municipality um, faces increasing liability in ensuring that not only are we complying with this, but as a fire department with uh, certain mandatory responsibilities. We also have to enforce a lot of this. Uh, so, so, you know, you've heard me speak to this before. We do have a number of uh, mandatory uh, areas that we have to, uh, you know, comply with. This is fairly new. It's legislated by the province. Uh, in particular, vulnerable occupancy inspections, such as uh, seniors' homes. And uh, we also uh, required now to respond to complaint inspections where we weren't necessarily before. That was more of a best practice. <laughs> uh, we have uh, stricter requirements for enforcing uh, the, uh, the codes, the Ontario Fire Code. And uh, what that is actually leading to is really an increasing demand on staff for prosecution times. We're finding we're in court a lot more just to do that. Um, Additional health and safety requirements for firefighters. Again, you know, some of the projects that are being requested uh, this year really directly speak to that. Uh, firefighter training and records requirements are, are stringent, more so than ever before, and as well as the apparatus and equipment inspections and records that we have to keep. Additionally, we have some increasing mandatory uh, reporting requirements uh, in terms of emergency management. Uh, that became particularly prevalent after the Elliott Lake uh, Mall collapse. There have been a number of new regulations just to ensure that every municipality is ready for a, an emergency. Uh, and that kind of boils down into uh, the requirements that we have to do for our, our annual compliance, not only for an emergency, emergency management perspective, but also for the Fire Protection and Prevention Act reporting. And the last uh, challenge I've identified here is we're really 
in a, a, a critical balance between a balance, you know, the increasing demands for services on the fire department versus what we have available in terms of resources. And we have some emerging demands that even five, ten years ago, they weren't even on the radar, such as uh, carbon monoxide alarms. Uh, you know, several years ago, nobody had ever even heard of them. They're a great idea, but now that they're mandatory, it puts certain pressures uh, on us from a regulatory perspective and response. We get quite a few responses. Uh, special events, you know, that was one of the um, uh, corporate uh, focus uh, areas is, you know, special events, uh, you know, agritourism. So that has certain demands on us, as well as migrant housing. We're finding in a, in a fire department, uh, you know, we're spread pretty thin. We, we do a wide variety of uh, services. And in addition to that, a lot of the services we do provide are being uh, increasingly technically, technically complex. And as I mentioned before, you know, the, the direct, direct correlation between, uh, you know, the service demands and the population growth in demographics. You know, as we get an, an aging population, for instance, you know, there are certain demands that are uh, relative to that that wouldn't be for a younger population, as an example. Uh, we're finding in today's society there are increase in more complex customer expectations from our citizens. Uh, you know, they're expecting us to do more and more every day. Um, and you've heard me speak of this before, there's challenges with actually uh, recruiting and retaining volunteer firefighters to provide a lot of these services. You know, it just seems like everybody's got busy lives these days. Um, and that leads into the next one is, you know, the, we're judged by uh, meeting some standardized uh, public safety response standards. And uh, that's, you know, <laughs> increasingly a challenge. And, you know, as the town grows over the next few years, you know, we're looking at what is the actual capacity of an entirely volunteer fire service. And that's always kind of on the back of my mind as a fire chief. And the last one that ties into a number of departments is the community emergency preparedness. You know, there's uh, what are the citizens' uh, expectations for the town in case, you know, a big disaster happens. Um, and, you know, are they really taking responsibility for themselves in some respects to, you know, get them through the initial phases of a, you know, w major weather event? But my sense is that they're expecting the municipality to help them and provide the service for them. And our capacity to, uh, to do that is, is somewhat limited. So opportunities, and we've uh, been doing a number of these. Uh, we collaborate uh, with uh, some of our partner uh, fire services in West Niagara and beyond. Uh, we have some automatic aid and fire protection agreements in place. Uh, we have cooperative purchasing ventures. Uh, you know, a couple of the things we have in the budget are directly uh, related to that. And we're looking at some new things, public-private uh, partnerships, especially for some specialized equipment. And uh, we're seeing more and more breaking down of silos within the town and, and working together a lot more, which is really more efficient for everybody. And another opportunity I always like to you know, highlight this is the volunteer firefighters, really dedicated, resourceful, capable group of individuals, and very, very cost-effective. And, you know, as we, you know, face the challenges of additional services and cost, you know, we're looking at opportunities to use them in, in other expanded roles where possible. So in terms of uh, the priority um, areas, of course, uh, one of the key ones for the fire service is uh, the delivering service in uh, the realm of a legislative, regulatory, and bylaw requirements. Uh, you know, you've heard this one basically to uh, manage the town in, a, in an efficient manner. Um, and then a couple other ones, uh, uh, develop a comprehensive cultural plan. And, uh, you know, we look at uh, trying to uh, support a, a healthy, vibrant community. And you know, maybe fire department isn't always one of the first departments you think of that, but you'll see one item in the budget in particular really speaks to that. And as well, the other one is, you might not think of right off the hop, is economic capability. People don't necessarily think of a fire department as a support to economic development, but it really is one of the, the foundations of it. If you have a strong, you know, uh, ability to support uh, growth and development, and, you know, that's just uh, uh, an attraction for, for development in the municipality. 
So if we look at the actual projects uh, we're looking at this year, uh, these particular four really re relate to some of the legislative and bylaw requirements and health and safety. You know, the firefighter uh, bunker gear, the bunker gear washer, the self-contained breathing apparatus, and uh, tanker truck uh, replacement. Uh, we get into one of the uh, items that is really um, affords us an opportunity for some improved service efficiency and, um, you know, better working environment is the extrication stabilizers. It allows the firefighters to do their job a little bit more efficiently. And the last one that uh, you heard uh, me speak of is the, uh, you know, support, supporting a network of the recreational trails and parks, as well as uh, supporting economic development through community events, you know, agritourism, special events. And that would be Project 10, which is the all-terrain uh, rescue vehicle. So some of the things we've been doing to address uh, the budget increases is, you know, we, we really, wherever we can, we, we're kind of shifting wherever we can the, the focus on spending money on, you know, big red trucks and, you know, that expensive uh, endeavor and trying to focus more on fire prevention and public education because the more fires we can actually prevent, uh, the less we have to respond to, which is a much more efficient way of doing it. We want to sustain the volunteer fire service just as long as we possibly can because the alternative with uh, full-time firefighters is an order of magnitude higher in cost. We have been looking at non-traditional funding sources such as dona donations, grants, partnerships with other agencies. Uh, we continue to, to participate in cooperative purchasing opportunities, uh, the bunker gear, the uh, self-contained breathing apparatus, uh, we monitor our performance metrics, making sure we're doing a good job, and uh, we've been working hard to align our fees and charges with the cost of some more specialized services to uh, cover costs on those. And that's it. So we'll start uh, Councilor McMillan. Um, thanks, Greg. The, all, all good stuff, but there, there's one glaring omission. Um, the Camden Fire Hall. It's it's in the 2017 10-year. It's it's not included here. Um, explain why. Through you, uh, Mr. <coughs> Mr. Chair. <coughs> Excuse me. That would be actually a facilities project, as opposed to a fire. And I agree with you that uh, should be, and I believe it it continues to be in for next year, if I'm not mistaken. It was actually approved, maybe I can refer to Angela, our treasurer. It was approved last year, and I believe that's a carryover amount. Yes. It's a carryover from Yes. I can. The Camden Fire Station was budgeted uh, purchase land and construction in 2016, so the funds from that project are still there, and they'll be carried forward to complete the project in 17. We any projects that were not completed that have begun, we won't be rebudgeting them. We'll be just rolling those projects forward as ongoing projects. Okay. So, so through to you, um, uh, Mr. Kakopoulos, if you could make sure we have all the capital items that are rolling from 2016 to 2017 available to us as a as a report for Saturday. Um, that would be helpful as well as we get into our discussions. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, absolutely. We'll make sure we've got that list. Uh, a number of the RFPs for the design work on those are going out in the next uh, few weeks. I can tell you we're in a similar position because I got the question uh, from Councillor Pacchariva around Pro Kitch Park, a project that was approved in 2016. You will not see it here as something that requires further approvals, but that, that RFP is going out. Uh, I believe Nick, I talked to uh, Director Hussein, uh, and that will be going out next week, that RFP. 
uh, as well. But we can give you a list of those 16 projects and where they're at in there. That would be good. Uh, rollout. That that would help as as we look at um, what's going on with it. So are, are then excuse me, Mr. Chairman, are we thinking? Is it the same thought process then for the museum and the skateboard park? Because they're in in 2017, 2017, but they're not listed in the 48 projects. So are they carryovers as well from 2016? Through you, Mr. Chairman, yes, Councillor. So we'll, we'll get you that exhaustive list so that Council has it for Saturday uh, so that you see both the museum project, uh, the funds that were approved there, uh, the Camden Fire Station number two, uh, Pro Kitch Park, I'm going off the top of uh, the top of my head, and, and the skateboard park, um, all things in terms of uh, you know, various elements, whether they're in the design element, in the design phase, uh, the location phase, uh, or the actual construction phase. So we'll have that information for Saturday. Yeah. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Njima. Thank you, Chair Foster. And uh, it is the uh, project number 31 is the Beamsville Fire Station temporary accommodations. Is that something we're going to be talking about under facilities as well? And can we talk about it a little bit here while we're talking about... Uh, Fire. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, we, I was going to highlight it at the uh, at the appropriate time during facilities, but uh, with the chief being right here, you can absolutely uh, ask any questions that you may have on that. Okay, thank you. I, I do. Um, uh, it may be more of a comment. Well, I, I guess uh, if you could discuss. I know that there's increasing all the time regulatory requirements um, constantly, and and that you have to keep up with, and that. Uh, um, maybe you can speak to the need for this and uh, and the advantages of having uh, um, all fire staff and administrative um, areas all together in one building. Three, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, this is um, a project that uh, was really born out of the fact that uh, we're expanding here corporately to at Town Hall. Uh, we've always had one of our. Uh, members the deputy chief has been displaced so we're already fragmented in terms of uh, department um, and we're looking at uh, possibly further fragmentation and uh, you know what happens with the facility here whether it's renovated or whatnot there there are some pressures to you know find uh, you know, additional space for for staff so the thinking here would be to uh, essentially uh, convert the existing training room at uh, the Beamsville Fire Station into a number of offices by putting up simple dividers and uh, allowing us all to be under one roof uh, for operational efficiencies. Um, and uh, that would allow uh, the fire department offices in town hall currently to be repurposed for other departments who, who need space and uh, to allow the firefighters to continue their training program the idea would be to either purchase or lease a portable classroom much as you would see in a, in a school uh, for uh, however long we needed it and then uh, once um, another uh, fire station i'm thinking possibly the, the vineland one i'm just thinking off the top of my head uh, is constructed there could be a permanent space uh, dedicated for fire department office administration space in that permanently a few years down the road. Okay, thank you. Can I ask a question, Mr. Chair? The so, how many offices would that free up? Three, for here in Town Hall. Uh, three, Mr. Chair. That would be three offices here. Yes. Okay, and I'm assuming you thought of alternatives, and that this is the sort of the best scenario for the fire department. Yes. Again, through you, Mr. Chair. Yes. This uh, we really are lacking in sufficient space to be able to. Uh, uh, provide office space, uh, counter space in terms of customer service. Uh, we have a real problem in terms of keeping records and files and things of that nature. So, so just, and, and, and I'm, I think what I want to do is I want to go back to the initial discussion. We're now kind of sliding into the merits, merits or lack thereof with okay. this. And I, so again, you know, I, I, by the way, it was a really good question asking about um, this particular item because it's important that the chief talk about that but you know the merits are lack thereof let's let's try and avoid that yeah, for this right. evening so <coughs> thank you um councillor patrila thank you chair foster um question to the chief with respect to um project number six i know that we purchased the um 
the washers a few years ago so the firefighters wouldn't have to drive home with the um, suits on. Um, just curious, and I guess this is a merit question again, uh -uh. but I won't be here Saturday, so I need a little levity. We'll give you a little okay, time. thank you. Thank you, Chair Foster. If, I mean, we've got four stations, four fire crews fighting fires, but only one dryer. Is this going to be a phase where we're going to ask for one each year, or, or, or are we going to wash the suits at stations two, three, four, and then bring them wet to where the dryer? I'm just curious how how you see this working. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, I believe it was last year we purchased three dryers uh, for Beamsville, Camden, and Vineland. Uh, this would be uh, a purchase for the Jordan. And this one is, a, we purchased this one separately. It's a little bit different than the other ones because it has the capability of uh, drying the, the water rescue suits. So, so are there any questions then on items number five through number 10 um, for the chief? You guys aren't going to be Bahan with the, the new all-terrain vehicle, are you? Right. Oh, that's a merit thing, I'm sorry. No, if I could just uh, point out to that too, that we do have some alternative funding. We have uh, a commitment from some uh, corporate sponsors as well as uh, from the Conservation Authority to assist with funding. And so um, this is one of the, the items I addressed in my uh, my comments before, that it's, it's not simply, you know, we're asking for money. We, there's, there is community support from a number of different factions to to support this. So. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Kakalis, or Mr. Kakopoulos. That's an old name. He left a few years ago. I know. Yeah. yeah. Mr. Kirkapoulos. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Public Works will be up next, and we'll go through the Public Works uh, capital project list. <laughs> The way we're we're not planning on any stops along the way. So if you want coffee, which is in the back room, or if you have to make a, a pit stop, you know, please get up and go. Thank you. Uh, th <clears throat> Three, Mr. Chairman. Um, Public Works, in terms of uh, some of the challenges that we're facing with our with our budget moving forward, um, we're continuing to uh, address our our backlog of road condition needs on our 300 kilometer road network. Um, <clears throat> we're also continuing to reduce health and safety risks around motors related to our deficient culverts and bridges within the community. And uh, again, making it a high priority to replace deteriorated cast iron water main in our water distribution systems. Um, also addressing our fleet life cycle needs with our, our uh, total fleet asset, which is worth $9.5 or $9 million. And uh, our main objective with that is so we don't have uh, service delivery um, disruptions for our residents. We wanna make sure we have a, a dependable fleet. Um, and also responding to growth trigger demands uh, for municipal uh, infrastructure upgrades within the community. Uh, opportunities, uh, our construction projects are all uh, shovel ready, which is really positive. So we can get a, a real early uh, leg up on tendering, issuing tenders early in the year. Uh, this has been successful for us in the past in uh, getting a you know, very favorable bid results and, and helping with our with our budget. Um, also, our project scopes that we've put together this year, we've tried to build in econom economies of scale wherever, wherever possible. Again, we want to do lots of work in one location, cluster our work. Uh, again, all trying to um, make it easier for contractor mobilization, which we see a return on that with our pricing. So. Um, trying to do a lot of work in, in, in strategic locations. Um, <clears throat> the uh, road improvement uh, program this year, we've also implemented uh, 
it will also allow us to implement uh, signed cycling routes within our community as per the town and uh, regional bikeway master plans. Um, proactive alignment between the road improvement program and the town's active transportation initiatives also in terms of sidewalks, new sidewalks that we have in the, uh, in the budget and as well traffic calming allowances. Um, we also are incorporating key scheduling dates with contracts to minimize construction related activity impact uh, in some of the tender fruit areas uh, where we've heard uh, from different farmers. Um, with all our pipe work or underground work, we're also trying to introduce and, and utilize wherever possible uh, technology in terms of trenchless no dig uh, measures. Again, uh, trying to use the newest uh, technology out there for that to try and be innovative in terms of um, cost reduction uh, in the actual work in comparison to some of the conventional uh, you know, full dig up works. And also it's, it minimizes disruption to the residents uh, as well. So we, we try and uh, use that wherever we can. Um, with some of our fleet purchases, we want to investigate some joint tendering opportunities with other municipalities and, and the region. So we're gonna be incorporating that this year. Um, with our fleet uh, replacement plan, we also have tried to look at wherever we can introduce some greening initiatives. Um, within our process. And again, as part of continual improvement with our winter operations, um, our one proposed project with uh, a new snow plow, we're also outfitting it with the pre-wetting technology uh, to pre-wet the sand and salt material, which has many benefits for, for the municipality. In terms of alignment to the priority plan, we're basically looking at uh, focusing on roads, transportation, traffic, uh, providing safe and consistent supply of uh, drinking water to town customers via fully compliant water system and economic development. So in terms of our roads and transportation, looking at some of our major projects, um, in general, we're, we're investing approximately about 3.2 million, which is a robust capital road improvement program for 2017. Uh, we're looking at about uh, 29 kilometers of roads, both urban and rural that we've got um, included in this year's program. Um, a couple highlights on our road improvement program. Uh, again, we're continuing to uh, incorporate the keeping the good roads good asset management strategy around uh, pavement preservation. Uh, it's a it's a really great initiative. It's basically, you know, smart capital uh, investment with our tax dollars. Um, at the same time, though, we're also balanced with our road program. We're also looking at addressing those roads that are in really poor condition. So it's a, a good balanced program we're looking at for next year. Um, a little more about some of the projects in the in the roads uh, program. The Drake Avenue neighborhood. Um, is our large scale road reconstruction program for next year. Um, it'll be full road reconstruction, new sidewalks, all uh, new underground servicing. And um, again, we're looking at economies of scale. We're doing the whole neighborhood. It's about a kilometer of uh, urban road reconstruction. And with economies of scale, you know, we're hoping to see some better tender results. And opposed to phasing this project, say over two years, uh, we we want to try and do it in one year, uh, which has a lot of benefits for disruption to the residents in the area instead of stretching it out. Um, other projects on the in the budget that's proposed is um, 9th Street. We have to replace a, a retaining wall out there that's failed. Academy Street uh, utility relocations. So we want to start getting prepared for Academy Street reconstruction. Um, and there's a bunch of gas main and other utilities that have to be relocated before we can go in and do all the road reconstruction work planned for 2018. Um, this will be proactive in terms of getting all the utility work done uh, a year before and get it out of the way so we're not sort of subject to the utility company's schedule when we want to do the road reconstruction work. So we've had situations in the past where we've gotten into trouble with road reconstruction projects where we've also had to get utility work done and try and do it in the same calendar year uh, can really mess up our schedule. So 
Uh, another project is the Charles Street Storm Sewer Diversion Project. That's a very important project uh, that we need to react to. Um, we've got a compromised uh, old storm drain that goes through some backyards up in that neighborhood and, and uh, it's failing so we have to divert a portion of it out into the municipal <coughs> roadway system. Um, projects 11, 12 and 13 are uh, culvert and, and bridge improvement works. So what we've done this year is we've collapsed all of our culvert work into one bulk program. Uh, again, looking at uh, <coughs> trying to take advantage of economies of scale with one larger contract. Um, and we have some bridge uh, improvement works as well in terms of design work. So there's lots of projects that are coming through here. So I think we'll do this part sort of screen by screen. So are there any questions to any of these uh, uh, projects? Uh, Mayor Easton. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, through you to Mr. Graham. <clears throat> um, Dave, project 13. <clears throat> Is it actually, um, or, sorry, um, Project 12? Yeah. It's Project 12. Is this um, bridge uh, non existent right now? Is that the bridge that collapsed and was never um, <coughs> refurbished? And it's been like that for a number of years? Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, through, through Mr. Chairman, so about, I think around 17 years ago, the town closed vehicle access over that bridge yes. um, because it was in poor structural condition. So it's remained in that state for the last 17 years. So it's at a point now where it's actually falling down and we have to remove it or do something else with it. So the, this, the intent of this project is to do some public consultation before we remove the bridge totally. Um, to, to get feedback from some of the public in terms of, you know, what are your thoughts? Here's our, here's what we're thinking. But we, before we can just go in and remove a bridge, we have to do public consultation right. around that. So right. that's, that's what this project will be. So it was motivated by the town, not um, the, the residents in that area. Okay, thank you. Uh, JD. Thank you, Chair Foster. Um, a question with respect to, um, Project number 13 and all of the culvert replacements. Um, and again, this might be one of those ones that we budgeted for last year in a carryover because in the 10 year capital plan, 19th Street was included. Is that, is that the scenario there? Uh, through Mr. Chairman, so what, what we've looked at, we, um, every two years we do a structural inspection of all our culverts and bridges. So we, we've, we've done that review this year and um, we ended up before we go through, before, when we're preparing for the budget process, one of our roles as staff is, is to refine the capital plan and look at where we can defer projects and make sure the, cap, the, the budget that we're looking at tonight reflects our most current needs. So the culvert on 19th Street, we can actually defer that another year. These culverts are a higher priority. And then a, then a follow-up too with respect to uh, project number 16. Having been in attendance at the PIC that night and there was a lot of questions around um, bearing utilities. Um, typically we don't do that in a, in a established subdivision, we do in a new subdivision. You made mention, David, of um, you know tendering this whole project together, one kilometer, looking to get better economies of scale. You've got a budget figure there. Um, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but any thought of if we do substantially save from the budgeted amount that, that um, you know, there is the possibility of um, relocating those services. Um, knowing though that and there would have to be some form of communication to the residents that, you know, the town can take on this portion, but you might be on the hook for, you know, $5,000 connection to do your own. Just, just curious on your thoughts because there was quite a bit of buzz around that and, and you know, wondering what you think. Uh, through, me, through you, Mr. Chairman, I mean, we definitely can, you know, have that conversation around it. I mean, it, if you're going to bury the, all the overhead services, it's going to be a significant cost. It's going to be way over our budget that we currently have, even if we see savings. But again, we can, you know, discuss that further 
at, at that time. I think it would probably be best um, in, in that thing to to give us a, a, an estimate on on what that would be, just so that we we totally understand, because it does have to be taken into account with everything else, right? So, any other questions on these items at this point, uh, Councillor McPherson? Thank you, uh, Chair Foster. Just uh, I overlooked it, but I didn't see anything on 13th Street and the uh, all 13th Street as far as the whole EA or, or what we're going to okay. be doing there. Um, through you, Mr. Chairman. Um, that'll be a project that's getting carried over. We've um, issued an RFP to start that review in terms of whether we're going to keep the road f permanently closed or um, reopen it. But we still have to go through that public consultation phase first. So. So now we're getting into merits or lack thereof. So, but uh, but Saturday and and in fact that other report will be very helpful to us um, as we're looking at that as well. So, so <laughs> and no high fiving, please. Yeah. Oh, oh, that was a slap. Through. Any other questions on these items? Oh, uh, uh, Mr. Through, through Mr. Conference. Chairman, I just wanted to I just wanted to suggest that we'll have that email out to you with that uh, list prior to Saturday. Uh, it gives council a chance to look at that. Have any questions that that you have in that interim? Uh, but definitely, we'll be ready to present it uh, on Saturday and, and answer any questions uh, as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, next slide. Uh, projects C fifteen and sixteen are. are are aligning with our active transportation initiatives, which uh, are, we realize are key council um, items as well. So again, our road improvement program this year, we, we also have included road candidates where we can uh, implement some bicycle routes th through, that, uh, through that program. Uh, with our Drake Avenue project that I recently just mentioned on the last slide, again, we're gonna be putting in brand new sidewalks, which are gonna be important walkway links for, for for the pedestrians, so um, we're gonna have that. Uh, project number uh, 27 and 28, in keeping with our speed campaign and, keep, and keeping that whole initiative moving forward, um, we're looking at considering uh, two sets of permanent uh, speed signs, they'll be solar powered, that we could uh, target on uh, a road in, in the Beansville area, maybe one Jordan Vineland area where we're seeing some speeding characteristics. So we'll have that uh, capability. We also would like to get another set of the portable speed signs uh, to keep keep up with the demand of the program. So we have that in our in our budget. So any questions on any of these items, uh, Councilor Patrieva, then Councilor Rajima. Thanks, Chair Foster. Through you to Mr. Graham. Um, question with respect to. Um, Project number 15, um, just curious, and I hope this isn't, Mer I don't think it's a Merrick question. Um, with respect to um, um, Hillside Drive, curious why it not being extended to Aberdeen. And, and then just a, just a, um, just a um, I guess kind of maybe a general question, if it would be possible, and I know we had it a while ago, where the overlays of what we've done in the past leading up to, to where we are now, um, future roads in the 10-year capital plan, so we can kind of see how this all pieces together. And then an added suggestion, um, the work that took place with respect to the wind uh, renewal, so Mountain View, those roads like that, because I know we're, we're finally attacking Philp Road, from Mountain Street to to the town's limits, and um, which is dynamite, long overdue, and, and the rationale behind putting that off was because of the the degradation caused uh, by the wind company in that area. So just you know, it would give us a really good snapshot of how we're actually competing, completing quadrants. And I like to see um, too that Vinehaven Trail is in there because that's part of the. Um, 
solution, David, that you brought forward last year to address some of those concerns of degradation in the urban core and how we're going to go down and, and, and uh, attack that. So um, thank you. Were there any questions on that or just come? Oh, okay. Go ahead, Dave. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So in, in regards to the Hillside Drive question, um, the portion of Hillside Drive in, in this year's budget that we're, we're bringing forward for consideration is just a, basically a pavement overlay where the curbs are. And then the, the piece further on I think you're referring to requires full rehabilitation. And uh, it, it's in the forecast. In the, I, I don't have the year offhand, but I'll, I'll get all that information for, for Council. Of uh, Councillor Rajima, then Councillor Burnet, and then Mary Easton. Thank you, Chair Foster. I didn't have a question. My hand just went like that for some reason. I don't know. <laughs> okay, I was stroking Lost control for a second. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Councillor Burnet. Thank you, Chair Foster. Through you to the director, uh, Dave. You you made reference in Project 15 and 16 to some road candidates in terms of um, bike um, bike bike. Um, not pass, um, what's the word I'm looking for, B bike lanes. So you'll recall when we had one of our workshops, there was a number of questions, um, I believe at the second workshop, in relationship to questions relating to the roundabout and how we had bike pass, you know, bike lanes on both entrance to the, to the uh, roundabout and then on the other side. Uh, and there was a discussion and a direct question to you that evening with regards to bike lanes on Green Lane. Is there anything that we're looking at in doing in this year's budget in relationship to that? Uh, through, through Mr. Chairman, we're, we're reviewing that currently. Um, what we are also plan on doing is um, doing a, a review of where we can implement <coughs> bike lanes now, like signed lanes, share the road type uh, concepts not building physical bike lanes so we're doing a re review right now where we can do those opportunities for next year um, but green lane is a high priority uh, we just have to decide whether we can simply sign it or we have to have physical lanes so we're going through that process right now Mary Easton thank you that was uh, one of my questions as well so I'm very interested to see what you have in mind. Um, Mr. Chairman, through you, I'm wondering, um, the other night when we were talking about, last night I guess, was the parking study and traffic movement. I just want to understand where where it will fit into, um, into the budget. Where can we expect to find uh, allocations for that sort of thing? I understood that we would need consultants to do it. It's pretty specialized work, so. Uh, through you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, to the Mayor. Uh, as I highlighted yesterday, we should have a draft strategy to review at the end of this week or at the beginning of next week as it relates to the parking strategy. We haven't identified any capital dollars in the 2017 budget. Um, I think what you're going to see come back, uh, and again, I've just had some preliminary conversations and Kathleen can definitely jump in. There will be some significant land acquisition that needs to occur in order to do those uh, parking options. Uh, it's something that I think we want to present to you um, when we're ready uh, and when we have that fulsome strategy and then determine, you know, where we're funding that from, how we're funding that, and likely, you know, something that we're going to have in the 2018 uh, budget for council consideration, uh, if not before, then uh, in 2017, but something that we'll have to address as part of future budgets. Okay, thank you. One of the one of the key things from our uh, recent um, trip to the Netherlands, um, as we were traveling around and and uh, with the little bus that we had, um, was the fact that every road had bike lanes properly aligned with the thing and you know the even the small lanes were designed so that cars could and bicycles could cohabitate within the things um etc i mean it's a completely different manner of of road setup type of thing but you know not only that but every road also it seemed that there were bike lanes and walking paths and stuff all over the place as well so Again, as we're going down the road to, to sort of deal with this stuff, I mean, we, it, you know, if we're, if we're going to be wise about some of these things, we really do need to 
to um, you know to think bigger. I, you know, Holland is such a small country, and yet they like small, and yet they're doing such big stuff. It's it's like I'm. Um, that was one of the key things that blew me away. So. Um, okay. Oh yes, uh, uh, Councillor McNamara. I, I just want to add to what you're saying about in Holland. Um, it, it may not be a fair comparison because the cars are smaller, and bicycles in Europe is a way of life. It's it's not recreational. It's how you get back and forth to work every day, and it's it's, it's quite a different situation. Absolutely. Okay, um, Mr. Kirkopoulos. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, I just want to highlight on the uh, on the point around active transportation initiatives and and bike lanes. Um, you know, I think what we're looking at doing is not just looking at green lane. But where we can, there are some, you know, prohibitions and standards around what roads can accommodate actually delineated lanes. But you will see significant signage uh, in terms of that share of the road signage and a significant communication outreach that goes along with that signage uh, implemented across town. Okay. Uh, Councillor Petri. Yep. Thank you, Chair Foster. And, and just a question, actually probably to uh, Mr. Kirkopoulos and Mr. Graham at once. Um, as you know, and I, and I shared with you guys yesterday, there's the new uh, impetus by the provincial government on uh, photo, photo radar, um, especially in school zones and uh, park areas and, and that. And, and in keeping with our speed reduction campaign, it might be another tool. Wondering if, you know, at some point we might be able to include that because I know that there's a revenue stream that will associate with that that the municipalities will be able to keep. And I think it would be a dynamite addition to the speed reduction campaign. And I would hate, I mean, especially because we're in budget right now, I would hate to miss out on a whole year because we're not, we're not planning there. So just, just curious. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, you, correct, Councillor. Um, you know, you sent me that. Uh, you sent me that article, and I know there was significant media attention. I read the Globe and Mail article as it relates to photo radar, with specifically within school zones, and then uh, I heard a number of media clips uh, on the radio as it related to that. Um, Dave and I did have a conversation, uh, and I think my question to Dave was, "What's the capital outlay that's required in order to establish uh, a sort of photo radar type um, type campaign from a capital perspective? Uh, and then, is there anything else beyond that that we?" We would need to do from an administrative function to actually administer that within uh, within the town, and I see Will nodding both ways, both yes and no, um, and uh, and uh, so we're definitely gonna we're definitely gonna look at that if there's something that we need to put into the capital budget, um, but definitely uh, you know it, there's there's a speed reduction element to it and uh, and, and a revenue element to it um, absolutely, and I think that's how it was being. Uh, communicated and I think sold for lack of a better word, um, you know, in the media. Mary Easton. I, I would like a little bit more clarification around the joint tendering. Um, <clears throat> I think the words used are we're looking into it or <clears throat> we're, we're looking into it. So I would like to know um, what efforts we've made to to joint tender do we have experience with this and um what would the barriers be why wouldn't we be doing this now through mr chairman so we've been doing quite a bit of joint purchasing through our joint purchasing committee so when um when we have to order culverts and those types of materials goods we do joint tendering with the region of niagara uh, also for our supply of salt and sand. So we've been taking advantage of that for quite a few years. In terms of our fleet purchases, we haven't done that before, um, but we want to try that this year. So we're going to be talking to other municipalities, maybe the region. Um, if it makes sense, if we're tendering the same type of equipment or vehicle or whatever we're looking for, we are going to um, try that this year. So we haven't done it for fleet before. Okay. I think, through you, Mr. Chairman, if I can just supplement that, I know the uh, the regional CAOs have struck a shared services type committee, and one of the items that was discussed at that committee, as we kind of went slightly off the agenda, was joint tendering, was looking at what sort of you know joint processes we can establish, um, whether that be the purchasing of trees, whether that be looking at fire vehicles, which came up, whether that be any sort of other fleet purchases that we need to make. 
Uh, that was something that I think um, the CAOs are going to be presenting back to the mayors as well as, as an endeavor that we should be looking at. Um, in some cases, some of the limitations are just around, uh, you know, having the procurement staff in order to do that. Um, but again, those are something that uh, the regional CAOs are looking at if that's something that we can um, collaborate on together, um, establish uh, the appropriate benchmarks, establish the appropriate documents, and, and these things become more more template-like and they become easier to administer. So uh, definitely on the radar of, I think, uh, a lot of the CAOs and, and a lot of the municipalities within the Niagara region. Uh, just one quick question to you on on digital, the portable digital signs. Do we have any go missing this year? Or are they, are they all in the fleet? Through Mr. Chairman, they're all in our fleet still. It was really weird out on Cedarbrook. They were they were up one day and then down the next, and it was kind of like we were more worried somebody had stolen them than uh, than uh, what's that? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, next page. Our uh, <clears throat> next slide here talks about um, the proposed uh, fleet uh, that we're we're proposing in the 2017 budget. Um, uh, council members may recall I sent out a quick update in terms of some of our f fleet life cycle processes. So this particular list of fleet, we went through our life cycle uh, process uh, just real generally. Um, again, we look at how old the equipment is as kind of a first flag of our screening process. Um, we're also tracking all of our maintenance costs on all of our vehicles and equipment. And we look at when the maintenance costs start to outweigh what the vehicle is actually worth, then we flag it for uh, consideration for replacement because just keeping in uh, mind that you wanna always ensure if you're investing into fleet, you don't wanna be investing into uh, fleet that's not worth as much as what the maintenance costs are that you're investing in. Um, so once we get to that state, then we have our equipment technician, we do a, a detailed assessment of our vehicle or equipment and look at can we actually defer this piece of equipment or, or defer this uh, vehicle even if the maintenance costs are weighing its capital costs we look at you know does it need any work next year um, and the fleet that doesn't need any work the following year and we think we can still get another year out of it we actually defer that fleet but when we look at um, and we quantify all the repairs that we know we have to do the following year and when we look at those costs, and we're already at a point where the maintenance costs are outweighing what the vehicle's actually worth, then we bring that forward at budget. And that's just kind of generally the screening process, just to, to share that a little bit further. Um, the, pro the purchases that we're asking for uh, consideration on uh, for replacement this year, um, the, we refer to it as the town car. We have a, a older Malibu car that we need to replace and we want, would like to replace it with a much more versatile vehicle being a pickup truck that we could use in all of our operation departments being SRC, water, roads, and uh, technical services. Um, our next uh, project uh, 21 is a snowplow replacement. Um, we have a cargo van that we need to replace in the SRC uh, division, uh, a riding lawnmower that we uh, need to replace in the SRC division, uh, a pickup truck in the SRC division. Uh, we're also looking at a new bylaw vehicle for the, for the bylaw officer and um, also re replacing the existing ice resurfacer in the Fleming Center. Uh, in this particular one, we've made a couple comments here in terms of we've, we're looking at greening that piece of equipment. It's, it's uh, currently a propane powered unit uh, and there's an opportunity to go to a battery powered uh, ice resurfacer. Uh, has many opportunities in terms of reducing carbon footprints uh, from burning propane. But one of the most important things that I think that we really need to, to think about is improving the air quality in the arena. Um, so that, that's a real big benefit to, to consider. Um, so that Councillor Thompson, you had your hand up? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
through you to Mr. Graham uh, in regards to Project 20 and Project 26. For Saturday, is it possible for you to bring forward a uh, sort of a evaluation of what it would cost from a, a mileage standpoint to not have those so that we can get a good comparison? I would appreciate that. Because I've heard sort of rumblings that, you know, perhaps we should just pay mileage and uh, so I'd just like to see the the possibilities there, if you would, please. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chairman, not, not necessarily specifically to the to the councillor's question, but I did want to highlight as it relates to I think fleet and and, and life cycle. Uh, again, you know, it's an issue that uh, I saw raised last year. I think it's an issue that you know council. Uh, wants to ensure that uh, they're asking the right questions, and uh, I definitely appreciate that. Uh, today, uh, I know Angela reached out to her uh, treasurer colleagues across the region uh, to discuss are there some other ways that municipalities are looking at um, for the purchase of vehicles. Uh, there were a few municipalities that used to lease. That's not necessarily uh, where a lot of municipalities are right now. I know one of the municipalities in Port Colborne, um, you know, typically purchases outright, which is usually the process that we go through as, as municipalities. But in the past, they've purchased um, when there is those zero percent financing opportunities and have stretched that out over a longer period of time. So I think we're, we're you know, I say that and I share that to, to let you know we are looking at um, creative ways and ways where we maximize um, the number of uh, dollars that we're putting out in this particular case and. Um, you know, in order to do it in a way that's cost effective and efficient for the municipality. I can tell you on the bylaw of vehicle, um, uh, you know, that's probably one that, that's required, but we can definitely come back with an analysis counselor as it relates to, um, as it relates to paying mileage versus um, having those within the, within the fleet. JD and then uh, Sandra. Thank you, Chair Foster, and um, question through, I think maybe to Mr. Kirkopoulos and then in turn maybe to Ms. Safani. The, the depreciation book value we use on our fleet, is that an industry standard or, or is that our standard that we establish? Just curious. The amortization that we use on our fleet is our standard. We are, use our standard, yes. And, and then a follow-up question to that, and I guess this will go to Mr. Graham. And I understand, and thank you, David, for providing that, that info um, about project number 21. And I, I'm, I understand that this is the last one of the uh, dump trucks. Now we, we rust-proof them and we do all that. Um, what's, the, what's the extension of the life cycle of those vehicles now that we've undertaken that type of process, or, or, or are we there yet? Do we have a, do we have a number? Because um, it seems that the, you know, the engine components are, you know, a diesel will get you a million miles, but we're having to dump these because of the corrosion effect. Just curious. Uh, through Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> unfortunately, we don't have a real number yet because we haven't been able to have an example that with the rust proofing program to go that far towards replacement. But I mean, by all means. Uh, it's another great opportunity and measure that we're doing to try and extend the life of these vehicles. So, um, you know, we're hoping to get another year or two for sure out of these if, if we can get the corrosion uh, under control com to what it has been. So we've also instituted a lot of aggressive washing uh, programs too to try and keep the trucks washed in, uh, with all the salt brine and stuff like that that gets on the truck. So. You know, we're doing a lot of um, measures to try and extend that corrosion, but uh, as we get closer, we'll have some better data to share for sure. I have uh, Mayor Easton and then uh, Councillor Bernay. Mr. Chairman, um, through you to Mr. Graham, project number 20, I'm assuming from what you said that this is not going to be a dedicated vehicle. It'll be in a pool. So um, I noticed that um, the SRC staff are pretty, um, pretty busy moving things around. Um, and I'm not suggesting that they need their own vehicle, but I'm wondering if we go to, um, I think I'm in the weeds here with, um, with a qualification. I just wanted to make sure that um, staff weren't in a position of having to purchase larger vehicles themselves in order 
to meet a demand that we had that they would be paid mileage. I won't say anything more about it. Mr. Chairman, I would like to see for Saturday a total amount for a fleet. <clears throat> I don't care whether it's broken up by department, it doesn't really matter. I think we should be, we should be um, approving a total amount for fleet and leave it to the staff to decide what they're going to replace. <coughs> This is very good to have this list. It tells us where the, where the important pinch points are, but um, I think we are definitely in the weeds if we start talking uh, any further about the details on these vehicles. We go through this every year. We know that vehicles have to be replaced. We can give you a block of money and, um, and you go out and of course do your very best. I'd like to see that list for, uh, for Saturday, what that amount would be. Uh, Councillor Bernay. Thank you, Chair Foster. Through you to uh, Mr. Graham. Um, again, without getting into the weeds, um, it looks like Project 23, it, uh, I guess, unfortunately, sometimes you have to just take a step back and, and realize that maybe something was a bad purchase, and it looks like you've addressed uh, all the options of moving it to Mount Osborne. So, uh, you know, if we spend 20000 to replace that massive Ferguson trailer, what, what is your anticipation? Like, like what type of a lifestyle should we get for that, that mower up there uh, moving forward? Through Mr. Chairman, um, I know when with our own life cycle anticipations for equipment and lawnmowers, we like to get 10 to 15 years. I'd say 12 years for sure. So um, when we definitely specify this lawnmower we want to specify a heavy duty commercial type lawnmower um, we'll also be involving input from staff we're going to be operating it when we do the specifications to really find out what's the best piece of equipment to do that work um, but definitely a heavier duty commercial type lawnmower for the use. Okay. Um, <clears throat> just two quick things um, the fire vehicle that um, uh, the one I was mentioning that we're going to be bahaing with is is that part of the overall group purchase as well? Like is that um, or is is that um, treated unto itself? Uh, through Mr. Chairman, typically um, it would be treated separately with uh, fire services. Okay, but I'm. <coughs> Okay, but we're looking at doing joint purchases yes, with yep. the region. So the question is, are we doing all the vehicles together as we're doing that? And it seems to me if we're doing it, we should be doing all the vehicles. Um, so, I mean, through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, I appreciate that clarification. Uh, you know, when we're looking at all our vehicles, and I know when I left that shared services meeting, uh, I did highlight to the chief that uh, one of the topics that was, ra that was raised uh, was the purchase of some of our fire, fire vehicles. And so where possible, we are collaborating and will continue to collaborate on those purchases. So definitely when we talk about all vehicles, that includes fire vehicles as well. Now, there are different needs from municipality to municipality, uh, but where possible, we're going to ensure that um, those bulk purchases uh, are made and uh, the benefits of those are accrued to each of the municipalities that, uh, that partake in that. And the other thing is, um, um, and this, this came to me last year, it was a comment that came back in and through. We have been typically purchasing red vehicles in the past and, and they are actually a premium cost apparently as it's going on. Um, are we going to move our fleet colors to white and and put our logos on the thing. Is that part of where you guys are going as well? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, um, you know I can I can take that one because it's something that I think early on was also brought to my attention. Uh, you are correct that uh, the, you know the special order reds. Uh, the type of vehicles we were purchasing in the past um, slightly had a premium. Um, we did look at a, at a, at a cost-benefit analysis of going with a regular off-the-line white vehicle uh, and putting on a decal that says Town of Lincoln. I think it's important. Not all our vehicles also had those decals. I think it's important for the public to see when we've got those vehicles and we're driving around that they're uh, representative both from a customer service standpoint and just a service delivery standpoint that we're there to provide services and so you will see us migrating a few of the vehicles have 
have gone to white. Uh, we're ordering, I think, the uh, uh, the snowplow dump truck will be white. Um, and I think there's some uh, there's some benefits to that. They're more recognizable. Uh, the logos will be bizarre, <coughs> The logos will be bigger uh, as well and uh, much more visible. So yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, good. And we've had, by the way, I think good luck with that electric um, one at the other place. So that's a good move on the ice resurfacer. So on to the next. Uh, through Mr. Chairman, um, moving into our, our water projects, um, Project 16, again, Drake Avenue, uh, just to comment on that. Um, <clears throat> when we do the road, we're going to be doing the water main replacement. Water main replacement is one of the main drivers to that project. Um, it's probably one of our worst performing water mains that we have, R really old cast iron, so we'll be addressing that need. Uh, Vineland West private water system, um, we've got in, that in the budget moving forward to construct a new municipal uh, water supply for that area. Um, project number 40, uh, Bartlett Road water main replacement from Heinen Drive up to Town Hall here. We're, we're moving that ahead in the capital plan um, based on some of its performance we've experienced over the last couple of years. We're seeing a lot more water main breaks with that uh, old ductile iron water main. So we want to look at design work next year uh, to start moving that project forward on based on how it's performing. We also have a Fifth I Avenue fire hydrant on Victoria Avenue uh, proposed to provide fire supply uh, protection for um, above the escarpment for the fire department. Just out of curiosity, and, and you can bring it up for us on uh, Saturday, but where does this take us to the cast iron in town? I, um, um, I know we're getting down to just bits and pieces here and there, so, um, but it'll be, it'll be a good number to, to be talking about in relation to this. Any questions on these items for Mr. Graham? Mr. Patriva. Thank you, Chair Foster. Um, to Mr. Graham, with respect to project number 40, um, Dave, is that analysis to allow it, taking into consideration the development along the South Service Road and the, the looping of the dead end Bartlett with an extension on, and I'm not sure of the road, but the industrial park, is that, is that your whole rationale behind that? Through Mr. Chairman, a good question for sure. We'll, we'll take a look at that. I know um, it's outside of the urban area for extending water, but uh, we're going to look at that with the design work to see what would be involved in that for sure. Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to Mr. Graham. Um, for Project 43, um, is the region coming to the party at all uh, in any aspect in regards to? sharing some costs with us on this? Through Mr. Chairman, so <clears throat> we've met with the region quite a bit through the design process to, to get their support on this whole project uh, because we have to use the Fifth Avenue Reservoir to get our water for this fire hydrant. Um, so we're looking at them to help where they can in terms of budget. Um, it's mostly our budget requirement at the moment, but there's going to be works at the reservoir required uh, we're hoping maybe they can help support some of those, but uh, we're, we're trying to, to do a joint venture on this with the region, so. Thank you. Okay, next. So under economic development, we'll just highlight a couple projects. So project number 41, uh, Prudence Water Main Upgrade Design uh, Phase. So we're proposing that for consideration to be basically be proactively start preparing for uh, the, and support the redevelopment uh, coming along for Prudhams. There's a lot of design work to figure out on how we're going to um, do this large water main upgrade, so we'd like to get that on the table and start that process. Uh, project number 19, uh, 23rd Street uh, urbanization design work. Um, this is in Vineland, south of Culp Road. Uh, there's a lot of development activity uh, occurring in that area that's going to require um, municipal servicing upgrades. So we want to try and align with that development timing and those needs. So we're looking at some design work next year to, to help prepare for that. Oh. 
Councillor McMillan. Uh, Dave, can I go back to um, Project 43? Sure. Um, the Fire Hall is, is on the course for this year or next year. There is a huge reservoir that's going along with that. Um, is the fire hydrant still going to be a necessity then with that fire hall and that huge reservoir? Through Mr. Chair, I might defer this to the chief. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, the uh, they are two separate items. The the plan is to have a strategic reservoir at the uh, fire station in Camden on Fly Road to provide an initial attack, um, and that would provide approximately 10 to 11 loads of water for the trucks, uh, and that would do for you know a lot of the fires we have. Uh, but it's it's a very finite supply, and we would actually need to replenish that as uh, as the call went through. But it would just give us an initial emergency uh, supply of water, uh, not only for the residents of Camden, but for the uh, Bethesda property as well. And then we would have to put into place measures to start to refill that as the uh, as the event went on. So they are. Uh, Connected to each other, but uh, they are dependent on upon each other as well. Thank you, Regina. Thank you, Chair Foster. Project number nineteen. Uh, I know you make reference in the in in the uh, literature to Willamette Landing development, and um, so in terms of timing, when are you thinking? I don't. I didn't look in the tenure capital plan. When are you thinking that we would uh, potentially be doing this project? So get it shelf ready, and then what? Through three, Mr. Chairman, so our, our first step is to get the design work started and try and figure out what we need to do there to accommodate the development and work with the developer. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's going to really depend on, you know, the developer's timeline on, on what, what they're looking at for, for building permits and, and, you know, what can they start with. And, and what, if we have the design there, at least you know, everything's figured out in advance. So it would really depend on the timing of the development in terms of construction when we look at constructing anything on the street. Okay. So. Thank you. Mary uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to request um, a list as well of all of the projects that are related to Prudhams so that we can follow that, uh, follow that along. Thank you. Um, JD and then Tony. Okay. Chair Foster, um, a question probably through Mr. Kirkopoulos to Ms. Safani. Um, just curious, um, project number 19, I see 54,000 is attributed to the capital tax levy. Um, any rationale because this is development driven that it can't be DCs? For you, Chair, um, the the project is DC eligible. So, if you look at the summary, sixty six thousand is coming from development charges. Forty fifty four thousand is coming from levy. So that means that there's a portion attributed to existing development, and then the balance is for new development. So we split that based on the development charge study. Okay, because I read roads development as roads. roads. I, 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 new I, development, I, I, yes. Mr. Bernay. Thank you, Chair Foster. Um, just, just a comment um, and maybe just a clarification. I, I'm sure this has all been considered, but um, Project 42, um, 1.2 million for that Victoria Avenue water main Queenie crossing. I know, I know it specifically says in the project um, that it's only recommended if we get the, if the Ontario funding comes through. But just something that I just recall from the recent um, uh, public meeting that took place with regards to Prudhams, and I know Kathleen was was present, I believe, at our table, and Councillor McPherson, and we had quite a discussion with a couple of developers there saying that in the next um, 30 to 60 days, there was supposed to be a big announcement coming about 
um, on what the ministry, what the MTO was going to do with that whole cloverleaf intersection of all those service roads. So I just hope that's all being considered because, I mean, if that's all being redone, you'd hate to see us spending $1.2 million and then all of a sudden that whole intersection is being redone. So I, I'm sure it's all being considered, but I just recall that conversation. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, and I can, uh, I'll, I'll defer, um, I'll, I'll defer to Kathleen if she's got any additional comments. Um, absolutely, we are in consultation with the province. We are looking at uh, any of the works that MTO is doing there uh, and how this project, if uh, if this project is successful in terms of receiving the funding, uh, that we can time it and stage it appropriately to make sure that those works are done. Um, and then if we're not successful, uh, you know, it's, I think it's one of those conversations that we need to have. This is an, an important project. Uh, we realize this year it's not necessarily feasible to fund this project as well as the other project, and that's why they're here based based on uh, being subject to external funding, but we'll definitely loop back with MTO. I don't know if Kathleen's got anything further to add. Um, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. In regards to um, some of the discussions that we've had um, with um, the Ministry of Transportation in regards to the Purdue Secondary Plan, um, what they've been focusing on um, is potential um, changes to the intersection depending on on sort of the, the development that, that that sorry that happens and what that could mean is sort of a re, like you know how there's different clover lease and things like that and they sort of had standard templates that they would like to put in place um, which will probably eat up a lot of land um, but at this point they really from what we understand they really haven't make it, made any decisions but they they will be inputting into the Prudum secondary plan process. So we'll probably have some better answers a little bit further along. Uh, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm not quite sure who who wants to take this, either Dave or, or Mike. Um, but I'm just wondering if you can speak to kind of the relationship between the capital um, and operating um, dollars what the impacts are moving forward on the levy, that sort of stuff. Just so for some clarity for us, if you would. Sure. Um, <clears throat> through Mr. Chairman, so in terms of our, our, our capital projects, in, in, in terms of infrastructure, where we're, we're replacing infrastructure, renewing infrastructure, um, it's helping us out in our operating budget because we're reducing those maintenance costs that we would have to do on those assets. So if we rebuild a road, we're starting with a brand new asset uh, and we're relieving our operational maintenance demands from our operational budget. But I don't know if that helps or not, but. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, maybe I'll chime in, you know, at a, maybe at a higher level. Um, I think uh, Director Graham is absolutely correct as it relates to the construction of new, um, of new capital, whether it be roads, sidewalks, those sorts of things, and how there's a benefit on the operating side in terms of monies that we would need to put out for upkeep, maintenance, and so forth. I think, when, uh, I think the best example would be something like a Fleming Centre. When you build a brand new facility, uh, are there impacts on the operating side? Uh, absolutely, if and, and when you need to add additional resourcing uh, to to address it, um, that's where you find those operating uh, expenditures. Uh, it could be also on heat, hydro, some of the utilities that go along with those sorts of um, larger facilities. Uh, where there isn't a connection necessarily is that if we address something on the capital side, there's an impact on the operating side, whether that's positive or negative. It's really dependent on the particular project, as Dave mentioned, uh, where you'd see a decrease on the operating side, and if you build a brand new large multi-purpose facility that requires additional staffing and that is three or four times the size of the existing one, uh, then there's often that, that, that occasional course correction that needs to happen or that analysis that needs to happen. Do we have the right number of resources in that particular location? Do we have to change the way we clean? Do we have to change any of those sorts of things? Um, typically we try when we're bringing, and I think we're, we're gonna be doing much more of this uh, with council when we bring capital projects forward uh, to look 
you know, two, three, four years down the road, um, you know, what may be those operational uh, issues that we'll find at those so that we're giving you a complete picture when you're looking at approving uh, larger capital projects. Uh, but I can tell you typically, um, you know, as Dave says, there's usually a positive net benefit uh, when you approve large scale capital. Uh, you know, specifically on the roads, uh, on the roads program and, and uh, on the vehicle program. Okay, so we slid on to the next page um, um, with the uh, two projects here. So Dave, do you just want to briefly um, touch on these? Through Mr. Chairman, so we're looking at mitigation efforts with our addressing our budget. Um, trying to manage any increases. So we're relying on external funding opportunities uh, for, for the project we just spoke about, the water main QEW crossing Victoria Avenue Vineland, the OCF, we made application through that program. <clears throat> the other one is the uh, Clean Water and Wastewater Fund. Uh, we've made application for the Conco Creek uh, naturalization <laughs> phase one project um, as well, subject to the external funding support any questions to this at this point I, I thought so Councillor Njima <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think let me just flip over to the project project number 39 I think it, I think it, it predicts that we're, we're applying for about five hundred thousand dollars in funding Is that oh six hundred six hundred thousand dollars Correct. I thought it was. I thought that uh, there was a potential seven hundred thousand dollars out there somewhere. Has something changed, or did I have it wrong? Through you, Mr. Chairman, I, I think Ange has got the exact number, but I, you know, if I recall what our potential allocation that we can apply for through the Clean Water and Wastewater Fund is, it's around six hundred and. Eighty-nine thousand or six hundred ninety-eight thousand. Um, you know, I'm going on memory, but it's in the high sixes, uh, or, or medium. You know, mid sixes. Uh, we can get you the exact number, but it was a calculation that the province gave to us in terms of what, or sorry, the feds gave to us in terms of what we'd be eligible for under that infrastructure fund. Okay. Well, um, an extra hundred thousand dollars would be nice, <laughs> but uh, I'm sure we'll we'll have the final numbers eventually. The actual amount that we have is actually listed in the budget. There's a provincial portion, which is 198653, a nice round number. Mm -hmm. And the federal portion is 397306. And then the other portion, so there's your 600,000. Then we have to kick in another 200,000 minimum to achieve these dollars. So that's where we get the $800,000. So 200,000 from us, 200,000 from the province, and 400,000 from the feds. Okay. And, and do we know when we're going to hear about that? Is there a date? January 2017. January 2017. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, any other questions to these two? If not, uh, next page. So some other uh, measures we've, we've taken, uh, you know, as always, we reprioritize all of our needs in the 10-year capital plan. Um, what we always want to ensure is the budget that we're bringing forward to Council reflects our most current and, and, and highest priority needs. So we've done that in this budget process. Um, again, continual improvement uh, where we can defer certain projects and works. Uh, we also want to supplement that with um, continual proactive operational programs through pavement preservation, um, ditching, roadside ditching programs, for example, with our roads to try and prolong the life of those assets. So that's continual improvement we always look at with our operational programs. Um, again, as noted earlier in, in the presentation, the fleet in, in the current uh, budget, we've done uh, mechanical assessments on that fleet to quantify what we have to spend in the operating budget should we not uh, replace them through the capital, pro capital program. So we've looked at all of those needs and quantified those needs. Uh, and again, continuous improvement on projects that have been completed. Um, we always debrief and, and look at, you know, what worked well, what didn't, and, and build that into the next year's program. 
Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, if I can make a quick comment, and I think it was Councillor Pachareva that raised it uh, relative to our amortization figures. I think, you know, we need to look at what others are doing. Um, again, I know that both uh, both uh, Dave, uh, Angela, and I are talking about fleet and, and, again, making sure that Council has that comfort level that we're exploring all potential options. So uh, we need to look at how we compare as it relates to those amortization figures, and I think, uh, you know, we'll be doing that. We'll be looking at what um, what other municipalities are at, what our comparators are at, how they set their their numbers uh, to ensure that we are making the best uh, possible uh, decision uh, in terms of our fleet replacement. All and then go to Dave. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a question on the roads rehabilitation. So a lot of discussion every year about uh, the amount that we spend on roads rehabilitation. And, and you've been very good uh, over the last couple of years at explaining how that uh, helps us to keep our good roads good. And the uh, question is, are we on track? Are we staying ahead of the curve? How are we feeling about million three, I think, that we've got? for this year, knowing that we've got a fairly significant amount of money going into a neighborhood, are we, are we staying the course? Can, can I um, take you out by the knees on that one and leave that one for Saturday? I think that's a valid question to be asking staff, um, and so they're pre-warned on that, but I think that's one that we have to talk about um, on the overall um, the roads program. So I go ahead, Mr. Kakopoulos. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, um, I think to Councillor uh, to Councillor McPherson's question, I think uh, you know, as SMT, we're incredibly cognizant of wanting to both stay at that level and stay ahead of that level in terms of ensuring that there's significant and appropriate investment in our uh, capital road improvement program. Uh, you see the number here quoted on the one slide of 3.2 million that incorporates. Uh, you know, that large Drake Avenue project as well as the existing projects uh, to give you that cumulative number because, you know, it is all roads and, and we want to give you that overarching road number. Um, again, we have identified because I think we've heard from members of council, um, you know, that there are some options to continue to address roads. You know, we've heard it, uh, you know, in, in a small way on, uh, on our survey. We've heard it at public meetings. Uh, we have presented other options and then we can get into that on Saturday as it relates to uh, should Council want to make further investment in that roads program to continue to accelerate uh, what you're doing uh, and where you're making uh, improvements that uh, that we can do that through those various scenarios. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through you to, to Mr. Graham. I didn't notice anything in here, and maybe I'm, I'm confusing it with something that should be in operating, um, but because we've made a sizable investment in, in GPS technologies in their vehicles, I was hoping to see something from a, either a you know, consultant or something to, to help mush through those numbers and figure out some efficiencies out of them. Because I know it's something that, you know, it takes a, certainly takes a sort of a trained eye to go through those things um, and really be functional with them. Um, and I'm just not sure if that's an operating or if you can clarify for that for me. Okay. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it, so Dave and I just had a quick conversation. It is, while it is operations, we are doing some stuff um, as it relates to that particular issue around our work order system, around looking at our routes and route rationalization, but we can discuss that at, at the appropriate time during that budget or should we have time on Saturday. Uh, we'll make sure we come prepared to answer that question. Okay, I was just concerned in case we needed something else uh, hardware-wise or software-wise, so. Next slide. Oh, Dave's Sport, done. Sport, recreation, and culture. Uh, long story. Okay. Um, Councillor Ajima. Thank you. I have a, a question. You, you may have said this before, but I, um, are we, I know that we're talking about this probably a, a number of projects that we never did um, uh, start. And uh, I know you're going to be bringing on Saturday a list of uh, projects that, we're going, that are rolling forward. Um, is there going to be a list of projects that we consider, um, that we may consider never starting? Uh, because they hadn't been started, 
and uh, and and looking at whether there was uh, levy money toward those projects. Is that going to sort of all be together on the same list? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, we can definitely do that analysis. Uh, I mean, while I think the list has you know half a dozen or so projects on it, I don't think there's anything that um, staff are recommending not be started. A lot of them, uh, you know, we're, we're in Q3 right now or Q4. Um, a lot of them, for for various reasons in terms of just the projects that we've been moving forward, uh, are ready to be tendered. Uh, so are in that design phase, but we'll, we'll definitely ensure that we've got that list, uh, and then we go over it once more in terms of are there any you know, works in progress uh, that, that maybe don't need to be started um, and ensure that we've done that analysis. But, uh, you know, off the top of my head, I can tell you, I don't think there's anything that, that falls into that category, but uh, I'll make sure that we discuss that with Director Hussein, Graham, and uh, Angela. Okay, thank you. We're, we're going to take a short break. We're going to start at two minutes after nine, bang <coughs> on. So if you're not here, you will miss out on sports, recreation, and culture. Thank you. No, exactly. We should sit down with you sometime. Come in for a coffee because we. Yeah. 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 Yeah.